I fell in love with my best friend. I had never heard of Gerard Carmichael until this deeply uncomfortable moment between him and Tyler, the creator, went viral. He sent me a voice note, so nervous. Gerard confessed his feelings to his best friend, and it didn't go how he had hoped. Like, when you said that, I think I replied with, like, something super mad normal. Ha ha ha, you stupid bitch. <laughs> I did. <laughs> So to clear the air, Gerard decided to confront Tyler in front of the big, expensive HBO cameras and crew, cut between footage of him telling his whole story on stand-up, all edited and packaged to be delivered to audiences around the world in the form of an experimental reality miniseries. It is the most awkward, invasive, voyeuristic thing to watch, and I was hooked. To me, these cameras, it's like there's sarin gas in the room, and I'm masked up. I mean, Dude, this is not a neutral eye. This is narrative that will be edited by someone where the editing will all be choices, that's not true. Gerard Carmichael is a comedian and actor who has been expressing himself and his most intimate feelings in the form of entertainment for a while. This installation, the Gerard Carmichael reality show, would follow him as he records his life and confronts his personal demons and damaged relationships, whether they be his friends, his family, or his sex life. As a newly outed gay man coming from a less than approving religious family, my mom said, like, you know, I just, these sins are tearing the family apart. You know, immediate 10 out of 10 from me. But as it went along, one thing became immediately uncomfortably clear. It was about at the end of episode 4, which opened with him crashing his 60 odd year old dad's truck he drives for a living. <laughs> Followed him, bully him by showing him pics of his boyfriend in his undies and closed with him cornering his father at a seemingly happy moment to talk about a deeply uncomfortable subject in front of the world. I made him tell my mom. It, it, it became too much. My biggest fear of my father is simply that he had more fun with this other family. It seems like everyone knew but my mom. Was it hard every time? Did you feel like a bad person? Why are you digging into that so deep, son? That I thought, this sure reminds me of something. You know what this is? This show is Seinfeld. Fire! We're watching a rich, self-absorbed prick run around and make life a living hell for everyone around him, then make jokes about it on stand-up. <laughs> I'd, I'd apologize to him, but I haven't talked to the nigga since. In this show, we watch Gerard cheat on his boyfriend, emotionally neglect and belittle his childhood friends, and air his family's personal business out to the public. And it's all very enthralling. I always wanted my father to be proud of me. The episode I mentioned before, Road Trip, was peak, peak dramatic television. It's just, you know, these aren't characters though. I got feelings too. Is this gonna be on your special? Uh, I, maybe, probably, yeah, I don't know. Can I go home? Gerard's been using his art to grapple with his traumas for a while, whether it be the critically acclaimed 2022 stand-up special, Rathaniel, where he comes out as gay and talks about his traumatic home life. It's kind of happening in real time, so it's not... Uh... I think she's... She thinks not reacting is the best reaction. Or his sitcom, The Carmichael Show, where he, once again, satirizes his family life, only, at this point, still in the closet. I got something I gotta tell you, Mom and Dad. Are you about to come out the closet? Is that what's happening here? In this show, he's living with his biracial girlfriend. You told your parents yet? Ooh. About us living together? Masha, the dismay of his parents. I know what you're doing and I don't approve. Well, I mean, if you had to pick, which one would you choose? Serving Jesus or freedom? Serving Jesus, because if it wasn't for Jesus, you wouldn't be free. Oh, look at you, all holier than thou, acting like we didn't have sex before we got married. No, that wasn't me. Gerard is using his work to confront his demons. Only in the case of this reality show, he's using the real people. And in what could be seen as a courageous act, he's being very honest about his own problems. When he confronts Tyler, He's the one who comes out looking pathetic when he's emotionally distant to his friends or cheats on his sweet, very patient boyfriend. He's the one who comes out looking bad. <laughs> it's exhibitionist. But what's wrong with that? Why is he doing this to himself? 
yes, his mother is homophobic, and he's clearly hurting greatly because of their strange relationship. Even if God doesn't accept homosexuality, that still doesn't erase your heart. Like even a person who goes and cheats, a person who chooses to go and murder. But I don't like watching him attack her when she attempts to patch things up in her own way. Um, I'm gay. I'm not choosing to be gay. I mean, you compare me to like a murderer twice. Not that she's right, but why must we see this? His father cheated on his mother and held a whole other life. But my God, you really have to corner this 60 odd year old man like this for our entertainment? Yet still, I could not stop watching. <sighs> what the f is this show? We're in a very strange time when the line between art and reality has become blurrier than ever and artists are almost inseparable from characters. I like fiction because I can hide my worst traits and hang ups behind characters with different names. But what I did not expect was that my non-fiction would be seen before my fiction. I am one of those who subscribes to the idea that the more personal a work of art is, the more people will resonate with it. And so far that's held true. For better or worse, the essay I've published so far that I've seen the greatest audience response for was one in which I kinda poured my heart and soul out about my struggle with trying to be an artist when that passion comes in conflict with the rest of my life. I received so many messages and saw so many people commenting about how strongly they connected to it and it felt good, but also very scary. A lot of those traits are very bad and there were a lot of people who rightfully called me out for it. In any case, people connected strongly because it was a deeply human story. And there were many who wanted to hear more about it. I don't want to take myself to those emotional places anytime soon. But clearly this is something people respond to. What happens there though, is that while they've consumed your story, and it's made its way into their hearts, your story becomes theirs. Your character becomes theirs. I made one big video where I suggested that the internet can solve a lot of art's problems, but both before and since, I have only ever complained about what the internet does to art. In an essay that you can see now, I've called the internet the graveyard of ideas. And while of course I wouldn't be that harsh about it now, there is still something to be said for what this structure does to the creation and consumption of ideas. On this medium for example, what you are consuming is fiction. That's not true. But it isn't and can't be completely real because I am writing, editing, and curating it to be a certain way. And when you consume it, you will filter it through your own biases. No human being can completely be captured on camera or through a microphone, and there will always be layers upon layers that will remain unseen, no matter how heavily documented. It is important that we all try to remember that as both creators and viewers, even though the infrastructure of the internet is designed to destroy the person and feed the character. Enter Christian. If you don't know who Christian is, I envy you, and frankly, I'd almost encourage you to skip ahead because I refuse to go into the lore in any detail. Today, I'm going to talk about a few people I don't want to. I've mentioned before that I don't like the idea of talking about other creators on the internet because I hate the spectacle of it and I'd hate someone to do that to me. I've had the idea, though I wasn't sure whether I'd actually go through with it, to make an analytical essay about the webcomic Sonichu and attempt to assess it as a work of art and what it says about the artist and escapism through creation, but <laughs> I just can't. Chris Chan is notoriously the most heavily documented person on the internet, and their life and the sheer spectacle around their online presence has been like an ongoing grotesque soap operatic reality show, bordering on true crime, especially in light of some of the more recent Oedipal developments. Again, I absolutely refuse to go into the details. Also, pronoun-wise, I am choosing to use the neutral term they because Chris's gender identity is also kind of controversial among even trans people, and again, I refuse to go into the details. There have been many documentaries, including one long, gargantuan one, which is currently at 85 episodes and still ongoing. 
In a past life, I fell down the rabbit hole myself and watched up to maybe 8 parts of that big one until I had to tap out. Chris Chan's whole internet presence is like a living testament to what happens when every system in place fails a person and they find solace in creating a sort of symbiotic relationship with their character on the internet, and the internet and an audience that finds entertainment in watching the spectacle. Chris Chan is a low-functioning autistic individual who for the past 20-ish years has been a walking piece of entertainment, even outside of the trolls who have directly controlled Chris's actions, making them do very, very not good things that I cannot and refuse to elaborate on. They have become a spectacle for onlookers who will make documentaries and think pieces like this one, talking about their life for the entertainment of others. And I've already said more about Christian than I want to. Cases like theirs are an absolute worst case scenario of what happens when a person and their flaws become a source of entertainment. Flawed characters are engaging characters. Whether you are discussing them as some kind of morality tale, morbid fascination, or even wanting to see them win. As long as a character is flawed, they can provide entertainment. This is why it is so ethically murky to me to speak about somebody who is a real, breathing human being like a character. When I did this exact thing to Orson Welles, I did it partially to make a point about how impossible it is to tell a story about a person, independently from your own personal bias. But also, he's dead and doesn't really exist outside of the realm of ideas anymore. I don't know if this is ethical, and you're completely welcome to disagree or challenge this, but death for me, especially when they've been gone for a while, is like copyright expiration. You can't cancel Stanley Kubrick from the grave because he can't suffer for it. Charlie Duvall is alive though, and I must admit one of the things that does pang me about that think piece is that I may have fed in maybe too much to the spectacle that's been made of her in order to make a point. A legitimate point. Well, she is a real person who is still alive and has her own career and ambitions and the shadow of Kubrick should not still be looming over her. And I might have fed into that for art and I kind of wish I'd gone about that a different way. But all we have left of Stanley Kubrick and Orson Welles is their art, their words, and the testament of those who knew them. They're already in the realm of ideas, so they're fine, I think. Chris is a real person, though. I don't know if they're still a real person anymore, or if the character created by the spectacle has completely erased any possibility of that person's existence. Even still, I feel bad for adding to the spectacle in what little way I have by discussing them here. The Human Zoo was a racist spectacle that was practiced in Europe around the late 19th to 20th century, where non-white people were kept in exhibits and observed, much like the name suggests, as we do animals in a zoo. Yes, this is a very real, very terrible thing that was practiced. And even before, there was the spectacle of freak shows, dating back to even the medieval period. People would line up to see people with physical or biological rarities and laugh at them. Of course, this phenomenon very much still exists in the mainstream today. What we now call reality television is, in many ways, a modern version of the human zoo. The spectacle of watching a disabled person make a fool of themselves on the internet for millions to gawk at is a version of the human zoo. The thing is though, now we are celebrating and even encouraged to make a spectacle of ourselves, making our own personalities and lives a form of entertainment. I fucked someone. The problem, I didn't tell Michael before it happened. So I just told him after. Why do you keep doing this? While I'm willing, if reluctant, to name drop Chris because they're already so well documented, there's another person who I won't name at all, who I watched for a little while some years ago. This YouTuber has made a career for himself vlogging his self-destructive lifestyle for entertainment and now lives off of that. I know I could be talking about many people with that description, but this person has literally made it his brand to watch him make terrible life decision after terrible life decision that often affects those around him. If you happen to know who I'm talking about based on context clues, please, 
I beg. We strain the ooh ooh I know I know instincts because I do not want to give this individual the free promotion that he so desperately craves. While with Chris Chan, I would say I was drawn out of morbid fascination. This individual I watched how to be naive investment in seeing him improve himself. This person is a neat who cheated on his wife repeatedly, eventually leading to their divorce, leech off of his mom who he would then complain about constantly. He also made strange expose videos about larger creators for clout recently as of right and he makes the same kind of thing and if anything he's only gotten worse. As the mirror calling out has progressed to stalking. This guy's been stalking people. The last video he uploaded as of me checking was him confronting a famous creator he had been making videos about in person. Physically. Nothing happened. But this is some dangerous behavior. This person has amassed a following over the years of hate watchers. Everyone wants him to improve his life as he himself expresses he wants to, but he keeps doing the same stuff. I for a little while was invested in the lore. What was the status of his marriage? Who was his girlfriend of the week? Had he finally stopped emotionally abusing his mother? What made me stop was maybe the second or third time that he announced that he was quitting YouTube to improve his life. It was frustrating seeing him continue the same cycle of behavior and me and all the people in the comments seem to universally be of the opinion that this is pathetic. Just call it quits and move on with your life, man. But then it dawned upon me. This is the game. YouTube makes him money. His self-destructive behavior makes him good money. This was maybe 4 to 5 years ago tops, but he still makes I'm gonna quit videos every once in a while when he sees the view count going down. Because he has become entertainment. His life, his flaws, his toxicity and self-destruction has been made into a spectacle. It's one he quite literally needs to survive, or rather, it's one he wants. I told him I cheated, and he said to me, do you want to open the relationship or do you need the transgression? Well, exactly. I don't want to call what he does art for the same reason why I hesitate to call any piece of reality television art. It's entertainment. I'm not always that heavy on the distinction between art and entertainment because there usually is overlap. But for the sake of argument, art could be said to be something meant to move you, while entertainment is something meant to keep you stationary. This guy's lifestyle is definitionally entertainment as he has not changed for years. He hasn't gotten better and there is almost no way that the audience has benefited from his stuff either. It's not good for a person recorded or the people consuming. This is generally the purpose that reality television serves, taking real people and their situations, exploiting them for the amusement of passive viewers, perhaps to make them feel better about themselves for a while. Gerard is not making a spectacle of himself and his problems purely to entertain us, and that is not how it feels watching the show. Gerard is actually seeking to change himself, and even mend his damaged relationships by making them into art. There seems to be a lot of questions around why would he expose the less than flattering parts of himself so publicly? Because it's true. And that, and that to you is the most important, no matter what. Yeah, I'm trying to make art out of truth. But and the other characters are not played by actors. The show may be entertaining as a spectacle, but it is structured to make you, or Gerard, confront these deeply uncomfortable moments. But it's just... Uh, why does he have to get all these people wrapped up in his little game? That's actually what makes the show super interesting to me, because it's people you would never see. My boyfriend wants nothing to do with it. It's only through his love of me that he's on here. My, my mom doesn't want anything to do with it. My dad doesn't want anything to do with it. Their love for you is why they're there. There's an episode where he confronts his comedian friend and pretty much tells him that to make his craft better, he has to make it uncomfortable and personal. Like he does. Bro, I want you to talk to a therapist. I think it would be really good. I think you'd be able to go to places that lead to more fulfillment. He is portrayed throughout the episode as being this kind of unfunny, insensitive, probably homophobic bum. Y'all gay, actually. 
This is my impression of Spider-Man taking a shit. But he is a successful comedian who helped Gerard in the past and is supposed to be one of his best friends, right? I was talking to Marvin today. Marvin. My therapist says Gerard made me go to. <laughs> in an interview, Jamar Neighbors, that's his name, expresses all these concerns, particularly about how his comedy is framed in the show. The Gerard Carmichael reality show is really supposed to be Gerard battling his own demons and fixing his troubled relationships, but particularly in episodes like this, we were reminded of the limitations of the medium. The show as it's being presented is in Gerard's honesty, but honesty isn't even necessarily the truth. I mean, I'm tired of saying how my dad wouldn't hear and do that. I'm tired of throwing people that I love up under the bus. There are like these kind of deep questions that you have. Gerard is looking for a conflict, or may find a conflict in his friend that may not even really exist. The episode really plays as Gerard kind of getting mad at this guy for not being like him. It's kind of terrible. What the f*** is this show? What is also so compelling, Gerard is being sort of an evil, terrible guy half the time, but it's always such interesting story. No, this is, this is Bo Burnham. What's up? Um, how do you feel about this conversation that you just had with Zach Swain? Dude, I can't... I am 100% absolutely stumped on this. Dax Flame is another one I was on the fence of discussing or not because unlike pretty much everyone else I've been talking about so far, I like him, I like Dax Flame and the work he makes, and I want to meet him and maybe make something with him. I, I think we'd actually be friends. I, I, Dax Flame, please, please, please uh, talk to me, message me, comment, something. I, 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 Dax Flame is goated and I'm legitimately a fan. But I want to talk about him a bit in this video because the relationship he has with his audience must be discussed. He's literally either the most brilliant person ever or like the most brilliant person ever in a completely different way. Right. Dax Flame was one of the OG YouTubers from the prehistoric age. Massively popular when he was 15 for making video diaries talking about his chaotic school life. So then, after that, I am boiling hot mad, furious, and he starts, he, look, he reaches over and he starts to tickle this, the girl Alice. And my anger was just reaching up. It was going up and up and up. And I turned around and I swiped him across the face just, in, just before he did it. Eventually, he grew up and like many creators of the time, he started branching out into traditional media, having supporting roles in movies like 21 Jump Street and Project X. But for a while after that, his projects fizzled and fizzled, until he got a regular job at an ice cream shop. But he's since returned to YouTube, largely because of a documentary by iDubs, this is how I discovered him, and now he makes various types of vloggish content on his channel. I figured we could meet at a park and asked if she had any park recommendations. Okay, so I do have an idea. I'm in the most incredible house. In and Instagram and TikTok. Ready for bed. also doing some directing and acting work with Joel Haver. Before I even started watching his stuff, I fell down the Dax Flame rabbit hole. Happy Saturday afternoon. Do you hear that sound? Earthquake! It's like hilarious. Thanks. Yeah. Did you know it was funny when you posted it? Uh, I, I think... Uh... <laughs> the reason I'm talking about Dax is because his stuff entrances people for much of the same reason we're drawn to Gerard show or the Chris Chan lore. Except we like him. I mean, it's easy to say, don't care what other people think, but that's not really advice. That's like, well, now how do I not care? Dax Flame has amassed an audience of people, both in the old days as well as now, who watch him because we're deeply fascinated by him. 
about the street races this past weekend. So I guess like apparently these street racers can put together, you know, a whole race with all these people, but they're not fast enough to get away from the cops. Um, and then... Personally, I just find him to be deeply inspiring because of his ultra-positive attitude and confidence, even when nothing is going his way. I'm Dexflame, and today I'm going to see if I can make you laugh. Um, <laughs> okay, so... Hmm... So, so nice to be home after a long day of work. Wait a second. I feel like I'm not at home. <laughs> I feel like, wait, is this Target? <laughs> Dax is a severely awkward fellow. Do you have ADD or any, any kind of condition? No. Do you take any medication? No. He claims he hasn't been diagnosed with anything, but he also hasn't checked. Yet still, he puts himself out there doing his comedy, talking to random people he encounters, and trying out various creative projects. In other words, he just like me for real for real. His awkwardness is precious and makes you just want to root for the guy. Unlike others I've been speaking about, I just want to see my boy win. When Dax does stand up or beg people for money in the supermarket... Okay, today I'm gonna improvise a joke and see if I can make a stranger laugh. It's, it's funny. Okay. Hmm. Not always on purpose, but I want to see my boy win! Though that's the thing about Dax Flame and the complexity of its appeal. I've often seen people, especially when talking about his older stuff, compare him and his style of humor to Andy Kaufman or Nathan Fielder. Which tracks because I've expressed my appreciation of both Andy Kaufman and Nathan Fielder in this channel. But just... They're so very wrong. It's been one of the oldest quote-unquote mysteries as to whether Dax's whole persona is an act. There was a point, believe it or not, when Dax Flame was the most subscribed person on YouTube. And it was because people thought he was this genius avant-garde comedian who just came up with these crazy stories and this silly but endearing character. He's literally either the most brilliant person ever or like the most brilliant person ever in a completely different way. Right. Because I was 100% positive that it was a complete, complete contrived character. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, but if that's true, that means he's been, he acts this entire time and stays in character. I have no fucking clue. Side note, Bone Burnham is involved in both Dax and Gerard's lore, and somehow I don't think that's a coincidence. And if it's not, if it really is him, then like, fucking props to him. For doing that and putting himself out like that and taking shit and everything. The humor of his stuff is genuinely so brilliant in this very natural but bizarre way. However, of course it isn't an act. If it was, Dax would be very rich right now. Like, Nathan was also making goofy stuff on YouTube when Dax was the biggest channel. I mean, it's kind of a superficial point, but every single one of his colleagues from back in those days is now super wealthy and successful in their respective fields. I love Dax to pieces as I've just spent the past few minutes expressing and I do think he's a great actor but if he really was the acting savant he'd have to be for this whole thing to be an act. He'd be getting interviewed by Chris Nolan and saving Smosh from bankruptcy. But what this also means is that back in 06 and 07 the internet ostensibly made a large spectacle of laughing at a probably neurodivergent teenager pouring his heart out about the horrors of his life. But I do still think he was a performer. I, I could tell that people, what people thought was funny, but like at the same time, I wasn't like trying to be funny. Yeah, um, it's kind of a mixture of you and a character. Uh, yeah. Dax has answered all this already, stating that while the stories weren't fake and he wasn't doing an act, he is aware of why people watch him and well, he does play to it. It's like While no one could possibly convince me that the man has been playing a character this whole time, I do believe that Dax is self-aware enough to know how to dance. Which is when we get gems like this. Oh, hello. Today at school? Oh, one second. My chair is really uncomfortable right now. I just don't want to mess with it. Recently, Dax posted an Instagram reel that went somewhat viral, featuring him taking a trip to a sports ball game of some kind.
it's just brilliant. I, I'm not too sure myself of where the line between realism and the performance is drawn here, but the awesome cinematography while he just stands blankingly taking it all in is just chef's kiss, brilliant, relatable cinema. I believe that Dax is a genuinely good vlogger and documentary filmmaker, so there had to be some level of self-awareness in the approach he took with this little art piece, though I also believe that he just wanted to take us with him as he went to the game. While it can always be speculated how much he plays for the camera, there's always a palpable level of sincerity and honesty in everything he does. Except this one time. For several months last year, Dax went MIA because of what he described vaguely as a situation. A private and personal one which he had to deal with. Now something uncommon, life stuff happens and whatever it was, you know, we wish him all the best. Most of us assuming it's a family member who's fallen sick or something like that. But after the months he was gone, he returned with an update video telling us what had happened. Hello everyone, so six months ago I stopped posting videos and kind of just completely disappeared from the internet. Some things have come out, so I wanted to talk about it myself, that way you could hear it from me. Does anyone know who this man is? Every day I come to the park I always see him here handing things out. I remember watching it. I think I actually got a little choked up. I felt a little nervous watching it because it touches on some stuff that I wanted to keep private. This is actually the exact kind of thing that Dax would do. I'm not gonna front with you, it, 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 it gave me a bit of well-needed hope for humanity. People have been telling me that the guy I posted in the video yesterday uh, was named Dax. And today I actually got a chance to talk to him at the park. And it turns out he's been coming to this park every single day and like helping people out and bringing them snacks. And it was so dang inspiring. Who's an unhoused man here at the park who lives here with his wife and uh, two toddlers. Uh, Cody unfortunately became ill, but Dax was able to help him with rides to the hospital and also help his family out with food and stuff like that. Then a few days later the guilt got to him and he confessed that he made the whole thing up. The praise, DMs, and comments I have received since then have been some of the best I've ever gotten, but I have actually been feeling a bit nervous and guilty since then. So basically, I have not actually been helping an unhoused family at the park. In full transparent honesty, that was someone who I had paid to make those TikToks, and that was a mistake. The response to this revelation was split. Dax's brand is and has been about unapologetic authenticity, and now he was saying that he lied to all our faces. I don't think I could ever hate Dax, but this was a betrayal. But then again, wasn't also kind of funny. The guilt would haunt Dax for the rest of the year, leading him to make apology video after apology video, then videos apologizing for apologizing so much. Then there was also this one video where he got a bunch of friends over to talk about why he wasn't a bad person. The twisted thing is that this is all still sort of on brand for him. I can totally buy that our protagonist would, in a poor attempt to inspire people, fabricate a story, then instantly be overcome with guilt and make 10 videos trying to amend his mistake. It's a betrayal, sure, and an obstacle that our guy has to get over, exposing some character flaws that we may have been overlooking, but it's a necessary point of growth on the journey of seeing our boy win. Luckily, we've moved on from that chapter and he's been doing bigger and better things. But I think there's still something to be studied about this culture we live in, where people and their actions, good or bad, have become fiction. I do believe that Gerard gets the same fix projecting his problems onto the screen that I get when I draw a really angst little storyboard about this glasses guy or write about the performative nature of interaction and somehow make it about capitalism, but I worry about what the effects of Gerard's little project will be. You, you treat the camera like it's God, but like the God on the other end of the screen is the public. Will he actually get better or is he giving himself a pass? by making his flaws into character traits. How do you feel now that people are taking these like very precious things in your life and now it's like being run through the Twitter conveyor belt? It, 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 it is exciting. <laughs> <laughs> will his relationships with those in his life actually improve or will they be permanently damaged due to this exhibitionist violation? 
Saying uncomfortable truths out loud sets you free. Do you believe in your heart the most effective way to heal things, to fix things, is to address these private matters publicly? I don't think it's the best way. It's the only answer I had. The video I spoke about earlier where I spoke about my art is the biggest example, but my philosophy towards art always has me making these get very personal. Authenticity is a big thing for me for preservation of soul reasons, even though on the internet I can only ever be a character. I try to write about these issues and lessons that I can also benefit from, which means that I must confront my own problems sometimes. I've, again, I'm submissive and vulnerable in art, mm. and it allows me to go someplace that I'm afraid to go in life, just day-to-day -day life. I'm using art to try and solve my life's problems. Mm. But the scary thing that happens, particularly in the formula we're dealing with here, is that those human traits become those of a character when I type them into my computer and deliver them through a mic. In order to foster an audience, I kind of have to create a compelling character. Not to lie, not to act, but to perform. What if by putting certain real human flaws into this character, I trap myself with having to perform them? It's entertaining, it's thrilling. It's very fun. It's like, it was like, oh man, a bunch of people are saying a bunch of things all the time. <laughs> but when those things are negative. Being called not a good person right. doesn't feel bad to, to me. Even in the Carmichael show, I, I always took the position kind of like the asshole's position. Not that I've been doing that. This is the fare I have for Gerard, and quite often the fare I have for other creators on this space who make a career for themselves based on their personalities. Will Gerard really improve himself after all this, or is it all just a big vanity project? Is he really putting himself on trial, or humiliating all his friends and family for the consumption of the pompous HBO audience? I suppose we'll see. All of this is like on a conveyor belt into fucking hell, which is the release. When you put something into the world, it becomes theirs. That can include you and your soul. In the end, I still don't know how I feel about the show. I mean, don't get me wrong though, for all the ethical qualms, I don't bother too much with all the identity politics stuff. But a show that takes us explicitly, perhaps too explicitly, into the world of a black gay man in America on this scale is an ultimate good, I think. This whole essay has been written with the premise that Gerard is a jerk, but I don't think it is as simple as that. He's hurt, and he's flawed, and he does some shit, but I do think it's ultimately good for culture that this show exists. Still, I don't know if it is ethical for Gerard to be plastering his family and friends' business all over the place just because they happen to be characters in his story. It's become increasingly normal to make yourself into a character for consumption, even if you are doing it for your own benefit. Art can be very therapeutic for the artist and potentially inspire an audience, but if there is no real growth, it becomes mere entertainment. Nothing is inherently wrong with entertainment, just try not to aestheticize traits that are self-destructive, even though those tend to be the most enthralling to watch and the most lucrative. This particular kind of art slash entertainment is still relatively new and we don't really know what we're doing. Dax, if you're watching this, hit me up and or leave a comment. I think you're cool, just don't be a slave to what I or anyone else thinks. And nothing's off limits on the hot seat so we can go from any any kind of and... Sex? Yeah, sex even. So, uh... Do you have a girlfriend? I don't have one. When was the last time you fucked? <laughs> uh, next question. For my audience, I love you, Aww. but you can tell me what to do. Don't tell me what to do! For Gerard, uh, I don't know, man. Just, I hope you get whatever it is you wanted out of this show. You know, fingers crossed that everyone's just watching TikTok. No one gives a fuck anymore. Teammates, billionaires, beat the records off the top. The homes and money is what we for selling base for two or five. Hobbies eating rappers whole. Yeah, never die just on dope shit. Stay coming out of him like crackheads. Wreck them. Fuck, I should be illegal. He was flying over the state, the model bitch.